Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and from the Holy Spirit. Amen. As you remain standing, would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, and we have uh, the cares and the worries of the world with us. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to set aside anything that might distract us. And help us, we pray, to focus in on you and your words of life and forgiveness and joy and peace and hope. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak those words through me. In Jesus' holy and precious name, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. I want to thank you for inviting me to be your guest leader for your free and joyous response stewardship program. And I want to also thank you for giving me the privilege of talking with you about giving. Because giving is important. It it seems that way from what God has told us in his word. Uh, You may have heard this statistic in some of your earlier sermons about stewardship. But in the Bible... The word believe appears 273 times. The word pray appears 371 times. The word love appears 714 times. And the word give 2,172 times. And so giving is important. And as we think about giving, And uh, it's giving in the broad sense of uh, time, talents, and treasure. Uh, As we reflect on giving this morning, I uh, come before you with three basic ideas, three premises that I'd like to share with you. And the first of these is how you give depends on what you believe about God. In the Maclean's Magazine, May 2010, there is an editorial entitled, Do Atheists Care Less? And in that editorial, there were some uh, most interesting statistics. Uh, They were uh, from Statistics Canada. And what they said was one in five Canadians, less than one in five Canadians, worship on a regular basis. But those who do are far, far more likely to give to charities, and they give more generously both to religious and non religious charities than those who do not attend worship, service re- worship services regularly. I uh, quote to you, the annual average donation from a churchgoer is $1,038. For the rest of the population, $295. And with respect to volunteer effort, two-thirds of churchgoers give their time to nonprofit causes, while only 43% of non-attenders do likewise. And churchgoers put in twice as many hours volunteering. And so what you believe about God has an impact on how you give. But my second premise is this, that how you give depends on what you think about God. And the two questions that are uh, revolving around this thinking aspect of God are, is God good? And is God great? And we'll reflect more on that later. And the third premise is this. How you give depends on what you love. We have a a saying on our church sign. I don't know where it came from, but I think it's quite profound. It says this. You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. And so the... The things that we love make a difference in how we direct our giving and how much we give. And my hope and my prayer for our time together this morning is that perhaps God might use me in some way to help you to fall more in love with the God who loves you so, so very much. And so we're looking at the parable of the rich fool found in Luke 12. 
13 to 21. And as I've heard this story in the past as I was growing up, uh, one thing you uh, should know about me is I'm, I grew up in East Central Alberta on a grain livestock farm. And so when I would hear this particular story, there was parts of it that just really resonated with me. Like I understood what it means, what it's like to harvest a bumper crop, because that happened from time to time in uh, my life experience as a young person. And uh, I understood what it was like to not have enough room to store the grain. And so this is what we would do, is we would take all of the farm equipment out of the machine shed, out of the Quonset, and we'd store the surplus grain in the Quonset. I understood that. I even understood farmers who retire and move to town. And I also understood dying and what that was all about. But there's parts of this parable that as I was growing up, I did not understand. And those parts are at the end where God says to the rich man in Jesus' story, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be, Jesus says, with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. I did not understand what it means to be generous towards God and why is it so important. And so let's go back to the beginning of this passage of Scripture. And it starts off with someone in the crowd saying to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus responds by saying, man who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you, then he says to them, so this is to the crowd in general who he's teaching, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in, a, in an abundance of possessions. Now the Greek word that is behind our English word gr uh, greed in our translations means wanting more. And the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament says this about that particular word in this context. It says, the material particular to Luke 12, 15 contains a fundamental warning, listen to this, a fundamental warning against all active striving for the increase of material possessions as a means of security. Now, is this ringing any bells for anybody? This is the disease of our time. And, and all of us are infected by it as well. I am. And so that's one issue. There's this issue of greed, this issue of wanting more. Here's another one. If you are good in counting, I invite you as we look at this next little section to count the number of times the personal pronoun is used. So here's what the rich man says. He says, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he, he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. There I will store up my surplus grain, and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years, and the personal pronoun is implied here, take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. How many times was the personal pronoun used when the man spoke? Yeah, 12 times? Somewhere in there. This man is totally self-absorbed. He's totally focused on himself. And then uh, there's this uh, verse. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. And so the Greek literally says this. This night your soul they demand from you. Now I used to always think, because of the way it's uh, put in the English, that God was demanding the man's life. But the third person plural indicates that God is referring to something or some ones other than himself that is going to demand the man's life. So who do you think that could be? I invite you to turn to the person next to you and just share who or what do you think is demanding the man's life.
You can talk during the sermon in this part. So what do you think? What's demanding the man's life? Greed? Yeah, it could be greed. His possessions. His possessions. He thinks he owns his possessions, but his possessions actually own him because they have become the most important thing in his life. They have become more important to him than God. They've become an idol to him. And whenever you have an idol, it will always demand of you a sacrifice. And idolatry always, in the end, leads to death. And so that's what's happening in this story. Whoa. So think about this. God does not need you to give to Him. God already owns everything in the whole entire world. Zion Lutheran Church does not need you to give to her either. Because, you see, Jesus Christ is the head of this church, and He will supply everything that this church needs to engage with his mission in this community and beyond. But the reason that you need to give is for your own sake. Because regular, generous, even sacrificial giving is what is needed to keep us from, or to keep our hearts orientated towards God and to keep ourselves in proper relationship with the possessions that God has entrusted to us. The danger is that you will become attached to your possessions instead of becoming attached to the God who has given you your possessions. And so you have a need to give. And your need to give is greater than Zion Lutheran Church's need to receive your gift. That's the whole idea behind this free and joyous response program. The central part of it is not because the church needs your money. The central part of it is you have a need to give. And so that's why it's important to be generous towards God. It's for your sake and it's for my sake. It's not for his sake. You need to give, but how you give depends on what you think about God. You see, if you don't really believe that God is good deep down at the core of your heart, if you don't believe that He has your best interests at heart, then what you and I'm including myself on this, what we do invariably is we keep back some of our wealth, some of our possessions from God because we have to protect ourselves, because after all, we cannot fully trust God because He is not fully trustworthy. He's not really all good. He lets things happen that we think aren't good for us. Or if, for example, you or I believe that God is not truly great that he is not able to interfere, intervene in the affairs of this world and make things happen, that he knows that they should, then what you and I will do is we'll keep back some of our wealth and some of our possessions to look after ourselves because after all, though God may be well-intentioned, he really isn't able to provide and protect us. So we are in the season of Lent season in which we reflect on that, on Jesus' journey to the cross. And uh, two weeks from today, we get to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
we get to celebrate the fact that the God who created the universe came down into this world and wrapped himself in human flesh and became one of us and experienced all of the sorrow and the grief and the hardship that you and I experienced, experienced all the temptation, and yet he did not sin. And then he did the most amazing thing. He gave that one perfect human life up for the whole world by willingly going to the cross and dying not only the most excruciating, shameful, painful death one could imagine, but by carrying upon himself the sins of the whole world. And then three days later, he rose from the dead. So what does that mean for us? Because what we tend to do is this. We tend to become complacent. We tend to go along with all of the everyday things that happen in our lives, and we tend to lose sight of what Jesus Christ, his death, and his resurrection mean for us in our everyday lives. So I want to uh, uh, tell you a story of uh, what Jesus' death and resurrection has meant for me in my life. So on uh, Saturday, July 21st of last year, uh, we were celebrating, we were in Alberta, celebrating my dad's 75th birthday. And uh, we were heading back afterwards. We were about two hours into our journey, and we get a phone call from uh, one of my sons, Morgan. Uh, some background information, my wife and I have seven children. She should get the medal, not me. Uh, five boys and two girls. And uh, so we were in Alberta with our four youngest children, and uh, our two oldest, Brandon and Morgan, were uh, in Langley at home. And uh, Logan was at a Bible camp, Camp Toolahead. And uh, two hours into our trip, we get a phone call from Morgan, and he said, something's happened to Logan. And he's in really bad shape. And his heart has stopped, and they're doing CPR on him. And... Uh, so we were just a little ways east of Stetler when we got that phone call. And then when we got to Stetler, we phoned him back, and he said that uh, the news he received was that they had, they had a faint heartbeat, and they were taking him to Princeton to the hospital. And uh, so we started uh, heading towards BC. We were going to stop in Calgary for the night at my sister's place, but we decided to carry on. And... Uh, as uh, we got more information, we found out they were planning to take him to Kelowna, so we um, headed there, and we drove as far as we could, and at about 3 o'clock in the morning, we stopped in Golden, B.C. in a parking lot to rest for a while. And uh, You know, a lot of things run through your mind in a time like that, and I know I'm talking to people who know that from experience. And I uh, couldn't really sleep, so I just rested. But I was, uh, I had all kinds of uh, thoughts going through my mind. There was uh, so many unknowns. And uh, finally, the, the point I came to was this. Um, I realized that the only thing I could do with the unknowns was give them to God. And then I thought about, what do I know? And I realized I knew three things. I knew that Jesus Christ defeated death. I knew that Jesus was with Logan. I knew that Jesus was with us. And that was all I knew but it was enough. And I also knew that those three things were true whether Logan lived or died. So we went uh, 
this, we were there for just three hours, so at six o'clock we continued the journey to Kelowna, and uh, uh, one of the first things that happens when we get to the hospital, we see Logan, he's sedated, he's, uh, he's, he's they've chilled his body, it's a protocol they use in a, in a case like this, and he's cool as a cum cucumber, and he's flat out, and he's got uh, hooked up to machines all over, and he's on a breathing tube, he's on a respirator, and not responsive in any way. And uh, the doctor um, has a conference with us, and uh, the doctor says, uh, here's the options he laid out. He said, uh, he, could he die from this? Yes, he could. Or he could, um, he could survive with severe brain damage. Or he could survive with um, min minimal brain damage. And that was the options. And uh, uh, so uh, then, uh, you know, at that point we knew a little more, uh, but yet uh, Susan and I were grieving for our son. So that's Sunday, January, uh, July 22nd. Um, Wednesday, July 25th, we go to the hospital, and Logan's still on a breathing tube. He's sitting up in bed. And uh, he makes a motion like this. And I said, do you want like a pen and a piece of paper? And he, and he nods. So I, I, I give him a pen and a piece of paper. And the first thing he writes is, what happened to me? No recollection. To this day, he doesn't remember being uh, at the water. What happened was they'd gone swimming and, and he nearly drowned. Uh, but uh, there's some good news. If we could show the next slide, please. Here's Logan. And uh, he's standing there with uh, Jesse Gertz and Aaron Bubel, uh, the two lifeguards who, who were there, who pulled him out of the water and who, along with two other people, did CPR on him for 45 minutes and saved his life. And he's recovered, thanks be to God, with no uh, side effects at all. And I invited him to come here today, but his girlfriend, who's younger and more beautiful than I, <laughs> invited him to worship at her church, and so... You just get to see a picture. <laughs> but I want to tell you about something else. Um, if we could have the next slide. I want to tell you about my dad, and there's a connection between my dad and Logan. Uh, my dad's name is Purvis Paulgard, and Logan's full name is Logan Purvis Paulgard. And uh, Logan is the only uh, grandchild or son that um, carries my dad's first name. And they have this special relationship. It's a little more than um, a grandfather and grandson. They're, they're kind of fond of each other. And uh, about 15 months ago, my dad had surgery for colon cancer, and he had a really tough recovery. And he was in the hospital for five months. And then he got out last May, and uh, things were uh, uh, improving. And last summer, when we celebrated his 75th birthday, he was doing uh, quite well. It seemed like things were on the way. Um, and then in uh, September, he got the flu, and he never really felt right after that. And in November, there was the diagnosis that the cancer had returned. And uh, he died on December 24th, the day before Christmas. But the things that I that God taught me in that parking lot in Golden, B.C. are still true with respect to my dad. Jesus Christ has defeated death. Jesus is with my dad. Jesus is with me. You see, when we have these kinds of things happen in our lives, what happens is our life gets shaken and all of our normal supports 
either show themselves to be faulty or they're stripped away entirely. And the only thing we have left is the only thing we ever really had, which is Jesus Christ. And here's the thing. The miracle that God did in Logan's life is like just a small picture of the miracle God did in my dad's life. Because you see, one day, Logan will die again. And in the meantime, Logan is still experiencing the effects of sin in his own life, and he's experiencing the effects of living in a broken, hurting, dying world. And while he's a young man, one day, should he live long enough, he will experience the effects of having a body that starts to break down and deteriorate and lose function over time until we breathe, he breathes his last breath. But none of those things are true for my dad. And if you've lost a loved one, in Jesus Christ, if they had faith, we can be glad for them. Because you see, my dad will never have to die again. Your loved one will never have to die again. My dad and your loved one, they will not be experiencing the effects of sin in their own lives or the sin in the world in which they live. And one day, Jesus is going to come back and he's going to raise us and all people from the dead. And those who trust in him will have bodies that will never grow old, never get sick, never die. There will be no more, as it says in Revelation chapter 21, no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. You will see Jesus face to face and he will wipe every tear from your eyes. Jesus' sacrificial love makes a difference in our life right now and forward into eternity. And that difference is what moves us to believe. It is through Jesus that we see that God truly is good and God truly is great. And so we don't need to strive for the increase of material possessions as a means of security because our security is centered in the king of the universe who is also the king of our hearts. We know that he is powerful enough and good enough to take care of us in the best possible way. And it is through Jesus, in response to all that he has done for us, that we are able to not only trust him, but we also love him with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind. It is because we love Jesus that we give. Because you cannot give without you can give without loving but you cannot love without giving and so my conclusion is this you and I we we need to give for our own sakes we need to give so that we have a proper attitude towards our possessions and so that our possessions don't own us we need to give um, that is to say pardon me we we cannot change what we believe. We cannot change what we think. And so even in this, we need to look to Jesus and ask him to come and help us to change our hearts and minds so that we live out our faith in expressions of love, so that we give not out of obligation, but with a joyful and cheerful heart so that we can live the rich, full, abundant life with Jesus that he came to give you. Amen. Let's pray. 
Dear Jesus, we pray for your help. We ask that you would help us. Well, first of all, we give you thanks for all the many ways you have blessed us, including all of our material possessions. But we pray that you would help us to hold those things in the proper regard. We pray that you would help us to have you as number one in our lives. And pray, we pray, Lord, that you would help us to be cheerful givers, to love as you love, to give in the same spirit that you gave. You have blessed us. We pray that you would help us to be a blessing to others. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen.